الرحمن ميوت نفسك لو سمحت My dear friends, I'm very glad uh, to have you all uh, tonight. We are completing our uh, clinical cases. Uh, Thursday nights on uh, YouTube at our CEC channel. And uh, as we announced previously, uh, this session will be about uh, Syncope. So uh, I will show you today uh, a very interesting uh, session involving first uh, clinical uh, guidelines uh, of Syncope uh, from the European Society of Cardiology. Uh, and this will be presented by my dear friend, uh, Dr. Sharif Tukhi. Sharif uh, is a cardiology lecturer at Ain Shams University. He's uh, a PhD and MRCP holder, and he's one of the best uh, clinical cardiologists as well as, as uh, scientific teachers in our department, actually. Uh, I'm very happy also uh, to have on board uh, my dear friend, uh, Dr. Hasib Raza uh, from Pakistan. Hasib uh, is a cardiac electrophysiologist and is working at the Institute of Cardiovascular Diseases in Karachi, Pakistan. And he is a board member of the International Young Academy of Cardiology. Hasib will be moderating uh, the cases uh, today that will be presented by Sharif. And he will give us a final wrap up at the end of this session. So now I will pass uh, the mic uh, to my dear friend, uh, Dr. Sharif, and Sharif will start sharing his slide. So please, Sharif, go on. Hello, you can see now all the presentation now? Yeah? Yes, you may start. Thank you very much, Dr. Zahran, for uh, this nice presentation. And uh, thank you, Dr. Hasib. It's very pleasure to be with you today. Uh, our lecture today is titled Approach to Syncope. We are dealing with how to deal with a patient coming to the outpatient clinic or coming to the ER, presenting with an episode of blackout or loss of consciousness. And this is the focus of these guidelines, which was released by the AC in 2018. The first thing we need to know, what do we mean by syncope? We are going to give like a resume about the guidelines in a very brief way. What we mean by syncope it is a transient loss of consciousness caused by cerebral hypoperfusion and is characterized by rapid onset, short duration, and spontaneous complete recovery. So it is not just transient loss of consciousness. No, it just it, it must be caused by cerebral hypoperfusion. So any loss of consciousness that is not caused by loss by cerebral hyperperfusion is not considered syncope. And the word pre-syncope, we mean it like two situations or refer to two situations. When there are some like a prodroma or a stage preceding the complete loss of consciousness, we call this pre-syncope. Or sometimes the patient may have like a symptoms of that he is about to black out, but he doesn't develop complete blackout. At that time, we call this pre-syncope. So we know, of course, that cessation of cerebral flow for as short as six to eight seconds can lead to loss of consciousness. And a systolic blood pressure of 56 millimeter mercury at heart level can cause this loss of consciousness. And of course, we hear the words blackout and faint, and they are non-medical terms, but of course, they are commonly used in some societies, and so we can use them. But it is better to avoid these terms like convulsive syncope, neurocardiogenic syncope, hyperventilation syncope, because sometimes they cause some confusion for some doctors, whether they are syncope or convulsion, so better to avoid using them. And what we are focusing today about every patient is presenting to us with syncope, we need to ask ourselves four questions. The first question is, was the event transient loss of consciousness or not? Second question, if it is a loss of consciousness, is it syncopal or non syncopal And third question, if in case of suspected syncope, is there a clear etiology for this syncope? And the last question, is there evidence to suggest high risk of cardiovascular events or not? The first question, was it loss of consciousness or not? The four criteria should be applied here in order to call this that this patient actually developed loss of consciousness, which are 
short duration abnormal motor control, which may be like loss of tone, hypotonia, or some patients may develop stiffness or even myoclonic jerks due to the hyperperfusion. Lack of responsiveness, that means that the patient is not responsive to speech or abnormal response to touch or pain, and amnesia for this period. So if I take meticulous history from the relatives and the four criteria applied at that time, I can call this loss of consciousness. Loss of consciousness, of course, can be traumatic or can be non-traumatic. And here we are focusing on non-traumatic because we are not dealing with post-concussion. Non-traumatic, it may be syncope, it may be epilepsy, it may be psychogenic pseudosyncope, and there are other rare causes that we don't commonly use. Okay, psychogenic can be psychogenic pseudosyncope or psychogenic non-epileptic seizure and rare causes like subclavian steel syndrome, vertebral basilar TIA, subarachnoid hemorrhage, and these are not the focus of our lecture today, of course. Second question. In case of loss of consciousness, is it syncopal or non-syncopal? There are some confusing diagnoses, of course. Epileptic seizure is one of the very common differential diagnoses that may confuse us and sometimes it's difficult to differentiate whether this patient has syncope or epilepsy. Of course, we know that epileptic seizures that can cause loss of consciousness are the tonic-clonic or tonic or clonic or atonic seizures. These types of seizures, which are the partial seizure and complex partial seizure and absent seizures, they don't cause loss of consciousness, so they should not be put in our differential diagnosis. Of course, there are a lot of features to differentiate whether this syncope or epileptic seizure. One of the very common differentiating features is the prodromes, which are, for example, in syncope, the lightheadedness, palpitation in cardiac syncope. Sometimes the patient may describe sweating, nausea, vomiting, but in epilepsy, they are different. They are like something called epileptic aura, like the deja vu, unpleasant smell, or rising abnormal sensation. Myoclonic jerk, it is very important to mention that it is not a differentiating feature between syncope and epileptic seizures, because it can occur in both epileptic seizure and also in syncope, because in syncope there is hyperperfusion, and this hypoxia can trigger myoclonus. But the jerks are usually asynchronous and asymmetrical in syncope, but in epileptic seizures, they are synchronous, symmetrical, maybe unilateral or bilateral, and more frequent than in syncope. Tongue pinting, of course, also, it is more common in epileptic seizures than in syncope. The duration of restoration of consciousness in epileptic seizure it is longer. Confusion after the attacks in epileptic seizure, of course, also is more common and more prolonged. Incontinence is more common in epileptic seizure. The cyanosis is more common also in epileptic seizures. Psychogenic pseudosyncope it is a terminology that is used in the guideline to describe some patients that, who develop loss of consciousness, but it is not caused by drop in blood pressure or heart rate. You are all following me now, that's right. You, you can hear me well? Hello? Yes, we can hear you well. Okay. Dr. Sharif, okay. please continue. Okay. Psychogenic pseudosyncope, it describes some situations in which the patient tells you that he developed episodes of loss of consciousness witnessed by his family or friends, but it is not caused by drop in blood pressure or heart rate. If, for example, you recorded an EEG, it will show just flat or slow signals. His eyes are usually closed with flickering of the eyelids or in the resistance opening. It may occur several times a day, but one of the key differentiating features that this is psychogenic pseudosyncope that he his family may tell you that the loss of consciousness may last up to 15 or 30 minutes or sometimes more than one hour, which of course is against true syncope, because as we know, true syncope is caused by cerebral hyperperfusion. And if cerebral hyperperfusion is more than five minutes, it will call, it will lead to cerebral insults. So of course, it is not logical that the patient has a syncope for 15 or 30 minutes. And of course, there are no prodrome. Sometimes the patient may injure himself. This doesn't exclude psychogenic pseudosyncope. And psychogenic pseudosyncope is important to diagnose and important not to call this patient that he is psychic or he is faking his symptoms because it is a psychological disorder that may need to be referred for a psychiatrist and may need cognitive behavioral therapy. And psychogenic non-epileptic seizure is another differential diagnosis in which the patient may have like epileptic sets, but it is not caused by epilepsy. Just I want to mention two important items. The vertebral basilar TIA is one of the important differential diagnoses because, as we know, that the vertebral basilar circulation supplies the brain stem. And if supplying the brain stem, it is responsible for the alertness and the consciousness. Any transient ischemic attack in this circulation may lead to loss of consciousness, but it is not considered syncope. But if, for example, I am dealing with a patient who is old, 
or have risk factors for cerebrovascular disease, and he developed loss of consciousness associated with other lateral IV manifestation like ataxia, vertigo, diplopia, I should put this in differential diagnosis, whereas carotid TIA doesn't pose any transient loss of consciousness. So we have answered the first two questions. Moving to the third question, which is, if it is syncope, what is the etiology? We know that we have three types of syncope, reflex syncope, orthostatic syncope, cardiac syncope. As we know, the most common is the reflex syncope, which is the most benign, followed by the orthostatic syncope. The least common is the cardiac syncope, which of course is the most serious, despite the least common. So for example, if we want to describe the most common type of them, which is a reflex syncope, or sometimes they call it like neurogenic or vasovagal syncope, but the two term is reflex syncope. Reflex syncope may be vasovagal, like, occurs, like it occurs in emotional stress, like, for example, unpleasant smell, sometimes after prolonged standing. It can be situational syncope, like, of course, we know the cough syncope, the micturation syncope, that sometimes when the patient is coughing strongly, or, for example, is micturating in a standing position, or like the trumpet, trumpet players, they may develop situations in cope. Carotid sinus syndrome, we know it that it is, occurs with stimulation of the carotid sinus, and there are other waveforms. The reflexing cope can be in a vasodepressor response, which means that there is a fall in blood pressure. It can be in cardio inhibitory response by slowing of the heart rate, and it can be potable. And what are the features that suggest reflexing cope? We need to know this because we will need to apply these features in our next cases. Number one, the long history of recurrent episodes. This patient is not just one episode that occurred today, but usually he has a long history of recurrent syncopes, usually in an early age, like for example, during adolescence. After, usually there is a trigger, like unpleasant smell, unpleasant sight, like pain, like stressful situation. After prolonged standing, and this is important, the word prolonged, it. not just that he stands up and he develops loss of consciousness like an orthostatic syncope, no. When he is standing for a long time, in a place where there is no ventilation, for example, and there is hot weather with sweating, these all are triggers for loss of uh, consciousness. For example, during heavy meal may lead to reflex syncope, and this is one of the triggers. Being in crowded or hot places, as we mentioned, all these are triggers. Usually there is a prodrome that precedes a syncope in the form of pallor, sweating, or nausea. Sometimes it may occur with head rotation or pressure on the neck, or for example, when he is looking backwards, this leads to stimulation in carotid sinus. And usually this patient has no heart disease because the presence of heart disease will make us push, pushing the diagnosis toward cardiac syncope. The second type is orthostatic syncope or orthostatic hypotension. Orthostatic hypotension, of course, we know it is caused by venous pooling during exercise or sometimes after meals, which we call postprandial hypotension, and especially after prolonged bed rest. The most common type of orthostatic hypotension is the drug-induced, with that, for example, some patients who have hypertension, we are more aggressive with them in the treating the blood pressure. This can lead to orthostatic hypotension, and this we need to be very alert to this important tip in patients with hypertension. And the volume depletion is one of the very common cause of orthostatic hypotension. So any patient who describe that he developed loss of consciousness shortly after he stands up from a sitting position, I need to think of his drugs and need to think of dehydration. Least less common causes that are very famous, that they, but they are not as common as the two first two causes. The primary autonomic failure, like for example in Parkinson's disease or in Lewy body dementia, and the secondary autonomic failure, which occurs in diabetes, amyloidosis, spinal cord injury, paraneoplastic syndromes, and we call these uh, causes like this autonomia, because this autonomia may lead to inefficient sympathetic stimulation to cause venous con constriction to push the venous return when the patient stands up. So the features that differentiate them while or after standing, less severe on absent or sitting, this patient doesn't complain on sitting on supine position, usually on standing, especially after exertion, especially after heavy meals. And of course, sometimes it is related temporarily with a start or change in the dose of antihypertensives, some patients may have history of autonomic neuropathy like diabetes, uremia, or amyloidosis. Cardiac syncope, of course, we as cardiologists pay attention to this type of syncope. It can be caused by tachy or bradyarrhythmia, structural heart disease, cardiopulmonary and fluid vessels. Usually, they occur during exertion or during sleep, maybe in supine or sitting position. And these first three features, of course, when we hear a patient who tell us that he had the syncope during exercise, not after exercise. I'm talking here about during exercise. 
when he was sleeping in bed, when he was sitting on a chair, at that time, I am away from vasovagal or flexing cope and away from orthostatic hypertension, I am more serious and thinking of cardiac syncope. Sudden onset of palpitation preceding syncope, of course, was the most important feature. Family history of unexplained sudden cardiac this is a very, very important tip that if, even if the features are pushing towards the first two types, if I hear these words that this patient has family history of sudden cardiac this, I am very alert and vigilant that this patient may have cardiac syncope. And of course, past history of structural heart disease is very important. I should also look for ECG finding that any ECG abnormality at rest may be pushing us, of course, toward cardiac syncope. Of course, there is a large table here that is mentioned in the guidelines that each feature of them may suggest a certain type of syncope. I will not go in detail with them in order that it may take a lot of time in order to explain it, but this table is one of the very important tables in clinical practice, and they are mentioned in the guidelines with two forms of this table. The last question, if I reach the cause of syncope, is there an evidence to suggest high risk of cardiovascular events that may need that this patient needs urgent investigations or may even need hospitalization or not? The high risk features are via history, examination, and ECG. Through history, for example, what are the features in history that may be considered high risk? New onset chest pain, transfer breath, abdominal pain or headache, all these are important features that may raise our attention. If the syncope occurs during exertion or spine, it is not reflex syncope and it is not orthostatic, it may be cardiac syncope. Sudden onset of palpitation, as we mentioned before. No warning symptom or very short prodrome at the time, I am afraid that this syncope may be cardiac syncope and family history of sudden cardiac death at young age. And of course, past history of structural heart disease. In the examination, if I found that the systolic blood pressure is less than 90, persistent heart rate less than 40 in absence of negative chronotropic medication, the patient is not asleep, and in absence of athletic training, it is not a high vagal tone. So it may be risky of bradyarrhythmia. There is a murmur that can be heard by cardiac auscultation and evidence of GIT bleeding on digital rectal examination. Also, I should look in the ECG for major ECG features that may raise our attention or sometimes minor ECG features. In this case, any ECG changes, I need to uh, pay attention to them. That may be due to a cardiac syncope. So for example, is the share, is the share is okay or it stopped? It's perfect, Sharif. You're going on very well. Okay. I just need you to raise your voice a little bit and slow the pace of the, okay. but it's going very well. Okay. Uh, so we, okay, so for example, if a young patient presents to us with unexplained syncope, but he has no history of sudden cardiac deaths, no family history, uh, no history, I'm sorry, of structural heart disease, no family history of sudden cardiac deaths, no syncope in supine sleep or exercise, no unusual triggers, normal resting ECG, at that time, the rate of sudden cardiac deaths in this patient is very low, reaching about one to three in 100,000. And that's why meticulous history taking in syncope is very important before rushing to investigations. Investigation, we can divide them into three types in order to be to think of them in an organized way. Basic investigation, bedside tests that I can do in my clinic, and specific investigations. The basic are the resting ECG and the transthoracic echocardiography. The bedside tests that can be done in the clinic, active standing tests, carotid sinus massage, and autonomic testing. And there are some specific investigation that we don't usually do them as a panel, but we choose one of them according to the provisional diagnosis like ECG monitoring, head up tilt table test, exercise stress test or the treadmill test, 24 hour professional monitoring and EP study. The last thing in the guidelines that when to decide that this patient needs admission, it depends on whether this patient has low risk features only like reflexing hope, situation or orthostatic, so he can be discharged from the emergency department and do his investigations as outpatients, or this patient have high risk features and he may need admission, or neither he is high risk or low risk. At that time, some clinicians prefer to have something called the syncope unit that is present in some hospital to observe this patient, for example, for 24 or 48 hours till we decide whether he is low risk or high risk. And so depending on the history and the ECG, I can decide whether this patient can go home or he needs to be admitted.
So now I have finished this resume about the guidelines and leaving the word talk now to Dr. Hasib to comment. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Sharif, uh, for this resume of the guidelines. Uh, actually, uh, we will take a one minute or two minutes uh, to take any comments from uh, Dr. Hasib, or if you would like to stress upon some important points uh, before he gives the final wrap up at the end. And during that time, if we get any questions, I will forward I will forward them to uh, Dr. Sharif and Dr. Hasib. So, Hasib, you have the mic now. Thank you, Dr. Zaharan. First of all, I would like to uh, thank you for having me here. It is always nice to sit among the intellectuals and uh, you get to learn a lot of things. And I would like to congratulate Dr. Sharif for giving such an excellent talk. Uh, I must I must congratulate him. And uh, um, it, is a, it is not an easy topic to talk about syncopy. It looks very simple, but when you start studying it and start learning it, um, it becomes difficult. And uh, the trick is to practice, practice, and practice. All the discussion that Dr. Sharif uh, has uh, uh, discussed with us is very, very important. Uh, what I would like to emphasize uh, in addition is the main thing when you are um, taking history of the patient who, who is coming with the blackouts or dizziness or something similar complaints. The main thing is you must be crystal clear about the questions that you are going to ask from the uh, patient. Because I believe if you are good at taking a nice history from the patient and if you are good at uh, doing a good examination, physical, general physical examination, I personally believe that you will reach at some some diagnosis at the end of the history and examination, even before reaching the all the complex tests uh, that uh, we can uh, use for the patients. But most of the time, you are uh, you are ready to fall in a category of a um, that that is the cause of the symptom, whether it is cardiac or non-cardiac, and the the other categories, autonomic and reflex uh, categories. So uh, I will again congratulate Dr. Sharif for the excellent discussion and I'm looking forward for the cases as well. Uh, I hope that the cases will also be, that the cases will be more interesting than the, uh, the talk that we have just uh, listened from Dr. Sharif. So yes. if we have any questions. Uh, Thank you so, so much, Hasib. Yes, we got, we got a question actually, and now it's, it's jumping to everyone's brain. Uh, can you please give me a simple algorithm for which I can uh, put any patient with syncope on this algorithm and accordingly I will know the pathway for the proper diagnosis and management? And the answer is, of course, it's coming. It's next in the lecture. But for me, as a cardiologist and as one of the audience also, the most important point that I got from this lecture is that I need to answer four basic questions for every patient and I have a basic panel of investigations to run through. Accordingly, I will get a very big flow chart that will include cardiac and non-cardiac causes, but from this very big chart, instead of diving in the chart and diving in several tens of causes for syncope, I am actually, as a cardiologist, interested in three or four very important and very common causes. And I think this is what we'll be focused upon in the next few minutes. So please, Sharif, I will pass the mic back to you again, and you may proceed. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Zaran, and I totally agree with you in your answer to this question. So our first case is one of the very common cases, and of course, all of us have seen this case scenarios many times. A 20 year old female patient came to the OPC complaining of repeated blackout episodes of three years duration. She mentioned to you that her episodes usually last for a few minutes and they usually occur during her work time if she is standing for a long time causing her many embarrassing situations. One of her episodes occurred after a quarrel with one of her friends. She denied any history of sudden cardiac death in her family. So, for example, this is one of the very simple 
and common case scenarios that, of course, we see them many times in our clinic. So if I want to apply the same questions that we explained shortly before, that we need to answer these four questions. Was her events loss of consciousness or not? In case if this is actually transient loss of consciousness, is it syncopal or non-syncopal? In case if it is suspected syncope, is there a clear etiology, whether it is reflex syncope or systatic hypotension or cardiac syncope? And is there evidence to suggest high risk of cardiovascular events or not? We need to pay attention to this case scenario again in order to select what are the information or the piece of information that may push us toward answering these four questions. First thing, she mentioned that he, she had blackout episodes. And if we investigated what she is saying, and she meant by blackout that she lose her consciousness and she developed blackening in front of her eyes, that she may fall to the ground. So actually, I'm speaking about a loss of consciousness. That's why I need to stress what does the patient mean by blackout in his own words. Also, she mentioned this is of three years duration. This is something that may push us toward much more benign diagnosis rather than cardiac syncope or malignant arrhythmia. It is difficult that the malignant arrhythmia will have this long history without causing any deterioration or without causing sudden cardiac arrest. Also, she mentioned that it usually occurred after standing for a long time. And as we mentioned, prolonged standing is one of the risk factors for developing reflex syncope. And this is not that classic or orthostatic hypotension in which the patient shortly develop syncope within one to three minutes after standing. No, long time standing may cause reflex syncope. Also, one of her episodes occurred after a quarrel, which is a psychological stress. Psychological stress can be a trigger for reflex syncope or much more specific, a vasovagal syncope, which something, sometimes is explained by the basal jarish reflex, that some patient with psychological stress Rather than having tachycardia and hypertension, they may develop hypotension and or bradycardia. Also, she denied any history when we faced her with this question in a nice way. She denied any history of sudden cardiac death. So, do we need to ask other questions for this lady? Do you think that we need to ask more questions? In my opinion, yes, we need to ask about other questions. And this is the importance of meticulous history taking for a patient with syncope. That's why in some countries, they make a dedicated clinic for the syncope because it takes long time to take history from each patient, much more than a patient with chest pain or dyspnea. For example, I need to ask her about warning symptom, preceding palpitation, past history of heart disease, or any cardiac symptoms, any associated tongue fighting, dirty motion, cyanosis, incontinence, or trauma. Does it occur in supine or sitting position or not? And does it occur with exercise? She mentioned that, yes, she has warning symptoms like dizziness and sweating before the loss of consciousness. She denied palpitation. She mentioned, no, I don't have any history of heart disease or cardiac symptom. She denied tongue fighting, jerking motion, cyanosis, incontinence, but sometimes she may have trauma. And it doesn't occur at all at supine or sitting position and doesn't occur with exercise. So now, after having these questions, do you think what is the type of this syncope? Is it reflex syncope, orthostatic syncope, cardiac syncope? Do you think we need to vote or we need to go directly because it is very clear for this case? Just give uh, a minute, Sharif, uh, to vote because I want the audience to be engaged with us. We will give uh, 15 seconds first for the lag between the YouTube and the Zoom, and then we will start calculating one minute. So uh, that's nice, Sharif. Uh, we've got more than 100 audience now. 
on the YouTube and on the on the Zoom, more than 100. So this is very nice, and this is good news that uh, what we are presenting actually is uh, somehow liked by the audience, which we consider as a great honor and responsibility for the level of science that we are presenting. Most of the votes are voting for, uh, actually all of the votes are voting for reflexive code. That's right, of course. Uh, it's very clear from the case scenario, from what we circle in her history and from the questions that we answered to the patient, we, we asked to the patient that it is a clear type of reflexive code. It is mostly vasovagal which may be also static vasovagal because sometimes it occurs with prolonged standing or emotional vasovagal because one of them occurred after a psychological stressful situations. The question now, do I need investigations? I have a clinical diagnosis that this patient has reflex syncope. I can tell her it is just vasovagal syncope. But yes, I may need some investigations. Of course, we are going to start with the basic investigation with the ECG and echo and they were normal in her condition. So the resting ECG was normal and the echocardiography was normal, which is a usual scenario in these patient type of patients. But now we need to ask a question. If I want to select another investigation from these three tests, will I choose pill table testing or active standing test or ECG monitoring? I will give up another vote for this. Okay, Dr. Yes, Sahar. Please. Yes, please, Sharif, uh, give us one minute to vote. So the question again for this patient, which type of the of the which one of these three investigation would you select? I think we have uh, lots of electrophysiology experts from all over the world. 99% uh, of the votes go towards pill table test. I have 1% to 2% of the votes going towards active standing test. So please explain the right answer, Sharif, and explain why the other answer was not the right answer. Okay. So, for example, if we mentioned the active standing test, which is a bit side test that we can do in the clinic, by asking the patient to stand up and follow up his blood pressure for three minutes. It may be helpful for suspected orthostatic hypertension in which syncope developed shortly after standing, not after prolonged standing. So active standing test may be normal in a patient with reflex syncope, even if she mentions that she has syncope after prolonged standing. So it will not be a good option here because we suspect reflex syncope. ECG monitoring, which has many types, like the halter, like the cardiac event recorders, like the new vest, it may be helpful in case of suspicion of arrhythmic syncope, when resting ECG is not helpful, but not in a patient with reflex syncope in which I cannot predict the frequency and it will not give a much help for me. So, tilt table testing in this case may be very helpful in case of suspected vasovagal syncope, and that's why I would select tilt table testing because it is designed for these types of syncope. We all saw the tilt table testing, which is very now much more available in many hospitals here in Egypt. When we need to ask for tilt table in patients with suspected reflex syncope or so static hypotension, it may show an, in the early form fall of blood pressure, but that's why in orthostatic hypotension, the active standing test can reveal it, but it cannot reveal the reflex syncope. POTS syndrome, which is a posture or static tachycardia syndrome, or psychogenic pseudosyncope, and this is class 2A. Sometimes we need to educate patients about the symptoms and to learn the maneuvers, but it is class 2B. The benefit that it can confirm vasovagal syncope, but the problem that negative test does not execute it. Positive cardio inhibitor response may predict asystolic spontaneous syncope that in some situations may raise the need for pacemaker, but we will need to explain it later. It can differentiate syncope from psychogenic pseudosyncope, 
and differentiate syncope with myoclonic jerk. As we said, the myoclonic jerk may occur with syncope. It is not against the diagnosis of syncope from epilepsy. The normal response with telltale table test is like there is a slight rise in the heart rate and the blood pressure with the tilting up to 70 or 80 degrees. The abnormal response that may suggest reflex syncope that after more than five minutes, it may show a drop in the blood pressure or drop in the heart rate or both of them may occur in the tilt-induced reflex syncope. And in this case, we can diagnose it. The problem is that sometimes it may show false positive results with the active stage when we are using nitrates. But if they occur in the passive stage that we are not using in medication, it is very suggestive of reflex syncope. In orthostatic hypotension, the drop in blood pressure will be very early within the first three minutes usually. And so it will differentiate the classic form of orthostatic hypotension from reflex syncope. There are some exceptions in each one of them to this form, but I am speaking about the most common patterns that we will usually see. In the psychogenic pseudosyncope, the patient in front of me mentions that he is dizzy and he is about to faint, but actually I found that his blood pressure is going up and heart rate may be also going up. And that's why we can diagnose psychogenic pseudosyncope from cell table testing. And the answer question that many clinicians ask them themselves is still table testing strictly needed for each patient with suspected reflex syncope? The answer is that if the clinical diagnosis is strongly suggestive of vasovagal syncope and far away from cardiac syncope, you can start your management based on your clinical decision. And the question now is why don't we perform active standing tests? We know why. Active standing tests, I use it to diagnose orthostatic hypotension that I ask the patient to stand up and I measure the blood pressure and the heart rate while the patient is standing, while it's so fine, I'm sorry, and then after three minutes of standing. If I find that systolic blood pressure dropped more than 20 millimeter mercury from baseline, drop in diastolic more than 10, or drop of systolic to an absolute value of less than 90 millimeter mercury, it diagnoses orthostatic hypotension. And if I found an increase in the heart rate more than 30 feet per minute, per minute from the baseline, or an absolute value of more than 120 within 10 minutes, it diagnoses POTS or the posture orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And that's why if I'm suspecting orthostatic hypotension, I don't need the tilt table. I can usually just use the active standing test in my clinic. Heart rate usually increases with the drop in uh, blood pressure, but in patients with neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, like the autonomic failure, I will not find this increase. Is there a role for carotid sinus massage in this patient? If the clinical diagnosis is suggestive of carotid sinus syncope, at that time I can use it, but it is not a routine test. So in this patient, I will not use it. If the patient told me that he has this syncope after head motion, looking backward, tight collar or shaving, I can use it. That I patient, for example, more than 40 years and he has unexplained syncope and usually this trigger, I can do a manual compression with three fingers at the side of maximum pulsation only unilateral. Of course, I don't do it bilateral. I need to auscultate to exclude any carotid debris. If I find, for example, that the patient has a systole for more than three seconds or blood pressure fall more than 50 millimeter mercury, but without symptom, I call this carotid sinus hypersensitivity. If he had symptoms with this drop of blood pressure, I can call it carotid sinus syndrome. If there is a systole, Sometimes some clinicians prefer to use atropine. And if the symptoms persist after atropine, it is a mixed form like vasodepressor and cardioinhibitory. And if there are no symptoms after atropine, it is just a cardioinhibitory response. And this is like a tracing of the heart rate and blood pressure with carotid sinus massage. So it is not a routine test, just in case of suspicion. Autonomic testing, like, for example, the Valsalva maneuver and the deep breathing test, we use them if we are suspecting neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. So for example, if a patient has an orthostatic hypotension and I cannot find any cause, I can do a Valsalva maneuver by asking the patient to do a maximally forced expiration for 15 seconds against closed epiglottis and find if there is an abnormal fall in blood pressure or absence of overshooting blood pressure. This may suggest an orthostatic hypotension caused by autonomic failure. Deep breathing test has also the same use for autonomic function. And we ask the patient to breathe deeply at six breaths per minute for one minute under blood pressure monitoring. So as we mentioned, carotid bypass massage and deep breathing tests are not routine tests. We use them in selective situations. The last thing in this case, how would I treat this patient? 
what shall I tell him? The first thing, please reassure this patient. Tell him that don't worry, you are okay. It is a benign condition. I know it is causing you embarrassing situation and you need to show empathy to your patient, but tell him that don't worry, it is not a serious condition and mainly conservative treatment will be adopted. The most important thing is, as we said, the guidelines mentioned, education and lifestyle measure is class one then we can depend on counter pressure maneuvers that we are going to say stopping or reducing hypotensive drug if it is taking any drugs the medications like fludrocortisone midodrine the pill training are all class to be cardiac pacing are used in few situations so we need to tell the patient about the benign nature avoid triggers try to early recognize the prodromal symptom in order for example that if he recognized that he had a prodroma he can set Except of instead of standing to avoid any situation like this, if he has having situations in cope, I need to advise this patient, for example, to make sure in a sitting position. If he is a male patient complaining of this problem, and increase the fluid intake and salt intake, although it is not very helpful in the flexing cope. Reduce or stop hypotensive drug is very important. Physical counter pressure maneuver, as we see, we see here, like I should. Uh, educate the patient about how to do them because it have like an it do like something like an isometric exercise that increase after load, so it reduces the severity of symptoms, so preventing complete loss of consciousness and the patient can rush to have a sitting position before or fainting. This is also an example of counter pressure maneuver. Tilt training, to be honest, is class to be so far, so I should not be very suggestive of it. I may tell the patient about it, but it is not. Uh, one of the very recommended uh, treatments. Medications that I can use like fludrocortisone and midodrine is class 2B in the flex and cope, so should not be the first line. If someone told the patient, oh, you may need a pacemaker, we hear this question a lot, that some patients come to us and tell us that one of the doctors told me that I may need a pacemaker. Is it right or not? First, I said that we need to reassure the patients. There are some features that may need pacing, like, for example, if a patient is having severe and unpredictable syncope at age of four years, and it is, for example, a cardiac inhibitory carotosana syndrome, yes, I may need a pacemaker. If he has spontaneous accessibility, for example, in uh, ECG monitoring or loop recorder, it may need a pacemaker. But in most of the situation, it doesn't need. So, for example, if we use this algorithm, reflex syncope, it is only class 2A. If the patient is having Spontaneous acetolic pose, it is class 2A at that time to put a pacemaker. Cardio inhibitory carotosinus syndrome is class 2A. But the cardio inhibitory response induced by tilt table test, it is just a class 2B for pacemaker. And I should not rush for pacemaker except in very specific situation regarding this. So the role of cardiac pacing, as we mentioned in the guidelines, it is usually in the cardio inhibitory response, usually in patients more than 40 years. He have documented asystolic poses or asymptomatic pose more than six seconds. At that time, I may think of pacemaker after failure of all other measures. Otherwise, it should be considered like class 2B. And if there is no features of cardio inhibitory response, please don't think of pacemaker. So I will leave the mic now to Dr. Hasib to comment on uh, this type of syncope yes. and mention his before, opinion. Before, before Hasib uh, starts his discussion, because I've got a very important question. Can you be, please go back to the interpretation slides for the tilt table test, uh, dear Sharif? Because I would like you to explain briefly uh, how to perform the test and how to interpret the test a little bit slowly because I'm getting questions about this particular issue. And then we will pass the mic to Hasib uh, to give us uh, like a wrap up or the learned lessons from uh, case number one. So okay. please explain uh, slowly, Sharif, how to perform the test and then how to interpret uh, the test. Okay, so first thing that I need to do is that when I'm doing a tilt table testing, I should take a history by myself, even if I am not the clinician, in order to know whether his history is going toward reflexing cope or not, in order to be able to uh, interpret the results in going with the history. I need to check the baseline blood pressure and heart rate I need to tell the patient about the test and what we are going to do. I need to have a heart rate monitor available and with the ECG electrodes attached to the patient. And I need to have a manual blood pressure machine. In some centers, they have like a non-invasive blood pressure monitoring, but I prefer the manual here in order to be able to check the blood pressure by yourself. The first stage, which is a passive stage that I, I, I tilt up 
the table up to 70 or 80 degrees. And for 20 minutes, I follow up his blood pressure and heart rate frequently. I should not leave the patient more than five minutes without measuring his blood pressure and heart rate. And I should tell the patient that if he feel any symptoms, he should tell me in order to check whether his blood pressure or heart rate is dropping or not. If at any stage of this or at any time of this stage, the blood pressure falls or the heart rate falls, usually we mention like blood pressure falls more than 20 millimeter mercury or the diastolic more than 10, or sometimes the heart rate is getting bradycardic at the time I need to stop the test and interpret it as positive. If the passive stage went unremarkable, at the time I return the bed or the table to zero and I wait for the blood pressure and heart rate till it recovers again to the baseline values. And then I tilt up the table again. According to the guidelines, they recommend to start the, or give the medication while the patient is up, not the patient is supine. And so, for example, here in Egypt, we use sublingual nitrates. We usually try to use a small dose to avoid false positive results. And I give the patient this tablet and that time I tell him also to tell me about any symptoms during the next 20 minutes. And if at any time I have any falling blood pressure or heart rate, I need to stop the test and interpret it as positive. Otherwise, if the 20 minutes went unremarkable, at the time I call the test negative. So that's it for the tell table in brief, according thank to you. the guidelines, thank of course. You. Thank you so much, uh, Sheree, for this uh, explanation. Uh, Dr. Hasib, uh, would you like to give us uh, what we learned from uh, case number one before uh, Sharif moves to case number two? Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, so the case one is regarding the vasovagal syndrome. Very common scenario, and we are going to see uh, very common patients presenting with the complaints of getting dizzy, um, and it is mostly related to their profession uh, while they are standing in hot weather and things like that. The most important thing which I was earlier emphasizing and I will keep on emphasizing this point because this is so, uh, this is so important that the history of the patient is the key to the diagnosis. And if you add physical examination on the history, there is a huge success you will not need any test. Yes, if still you have confusion, till table test is still done throughout the world to diagnose vasovagal syncope. But trust me, I have uh, diagnosed many cases. It is a common scenario. You do not need to go to that extent uh, that you have to go for the till table test. Another thing that I, wa I want to highlight in this case is usually the patients, uh, they drive the vehicles, they, um, whether they are the government apply, uh, employees or they have their own cars. And these patients, when they come to you uh, and, they, and you diagnose them that they have the vasovagal syncope, now this is a huge concern because usually we say vasovagal syncope is benign, benign. It is benign as long as you are in the home. But if you are driving and you, bad luck, you went into that uh, syncope, so you are in not yourself in danger, but the passenger alongside sitting alongside you, that passenger is also in danger. So that's why there are some recommendations uh, which are mentioned in the uh, American Heart Association guidelines regarding the syncope. And uh, these guidelines state if the patient is having one to six episodes of syncope in last one month, one to six episodes of syncope the last uh, month, you should stop that patient to drive, rush that patient to the hospital, teach him the counter pressure maneuvers and teach him about the fluid intake and all those things which are the um, treatment measurements in this case. And if there are more than six episodes, you just stop it. That patient needs uh, rehabilitation that patient uh, is uh, at high risk of danger for not only for himself, but also for the other people. And, and th that document says if in the last one year, the patient did not develop any syncope, then you can let him drive for sure. So I just wanted to add this thing in the, in this case, uh, perfect case, uh, the test, the table, uh, the tilt table test uh, is still being used, very useful. It is a cheap available everywhere. In, uh, of this for sure 
and must learn the different patterns of interpretation the different responses that you get from the tilt table test because because of those interpretations you can decide whether you have to go for a pacemaker or not uh, i being the electrophysiologist people always they uh, they call me and they ask me this question doctor if this pacemaker is going to help it or not so uh, tilt table is definitely has its own space right now and uh, most common scenario please 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 never miss it never miss it i want to ask you a question hasib because usually uh, the tilt table test involves uh, changing the patient's position in several uh, angles uh, and uh, we usually advise the patients to be fasting for four hours to avoid vomiting and stuff like this. Uh, some patients usually do the fasting overnight, so they come fasting for 12 to 16 hours, and usually the patients are kind of volume depleted or a little bit dehydrated. Does dehydration or volume depletion affect the degree of sensitivity or specificity of the tilt table test? Okay, uh, Dr. Zaran, very nice question. So, uh, so uh, let me take you through the pro through the process of tail table. What we are actually doing in tail table test, we are um, making the uh, making the position the erect position for the patient. And why why we are doing it? Because we want the cooling of the blood in the legs in the vessels of the legs. We actually we are trying to create that scenario which naturally occurs in the life of that patient. The patient was standing at the bus station and suddenly he dropped. Why? Because there was cooling of the blood in the vessels. And uh, let me take you another further step. So even you uh, usually we go to the degree of 70 to 90 degree and we wait for uh, 25 minutes and 30 minutes usually. And even that uh, after 25 to 30 minutes, you are not getting any response. The patient is well no prodrome or no uh, no blackout what you do you go into the active phase and what you do you spray sublingual nitrate and why you do that because you want to provoke it so, so even the patient is dehydrated this will lead to the provocation okay now the problem arises when you have a patient for example like a patient of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with lbot obstruction in, in such patients, yes, the your question is valid in those patients because in such patients, you will have false positive results of tilt table test because of the dehydration. Already, the LVOT is obstructed because of the myopathy. And even the patient, a little bit of the dehydration will provoke the response. And the patient is having syncope due to VT. Okay? And you will yes. do the tilt table test and you will get the response as a positive tilt table test. And you will say, oh my God, you have positive tilt table test? No need to worry. It is just visual syncope. Go home and he will come back in the emergency with sudden cardiac arrest. So yes, there are caveats. I agree with you. But usually you want to provoke it. So four to six hours of uh, fasting doesn't matter. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Hasib, uh, for elaborating uh, this point. So I will pass the mic again to Sharif, uh, so Sharif can go with the next uh, with the next uh, case, please. Okay. So our case number two, of course, is one of the situations that is not uncommon to see in our practice. A 16-year-old male patient came to the OBC, accompanied by his parents, concerned regarding an event that occurred two days ago. He mentions that he was playing a basketball match with his team, as he is a professional player and he suddenly uh, collapsed while playing as he played lightheadedness and then he fell to the ground causing a contusion at his head. And he was told by his colleagues that he was totally unresponsive for about less than one minute and then he recovered his awareness spontaneously, but he doesn't remember anything after his blackout. Again, we need to answer these four questions. Was it loss of consciousness or syncopal or non-syncopal? As we said so here, yes, most probably from what he mentioned and what was told by his colleagues, it is a loss of consciousness. He fell to the ground and he had like a, contusion, a trauma to his head, which is very serious to us that the patient hurts himself because of the loss of consciousness. And we are more pushed towards in Kobo because just of one thing, 
The patient has loss of consciousness during exercise. It is very alerting to us as cardiologists. Let's repeat the same way. He is having a syncope during basketball match. He fell to the ground causing contusion, so he hurts himself because of the total loss of consciousness. He was told by his colleagues that he was totally unresponsive for less than one minute, which is more toward loss of consciousness. And also we need to stress about something that he doesn't remember anything. So all of this is going toward loss of consciousness. Do we need to ask other question? As we mentioned in the first case, yes, of course. It is not just that the patient told me that I fainted during a match, so I will go directly to cardiac syncope. No, there are much more questions I need to ask, ask this patient. Did you have warning symptoms? Did you have palpitation? Do you have past history of heart disease or any cardiac symptom? Any associated tongue biting, jerky motion, cyanosis, incontinence, or trauma here? He mentioned trauma, of course. Does it occur in supine or sitting position? Family history of sounding cardiac, this is it present or not. He denied any prodrome, which is very serious. He doesn't remember whether he had palpitation or not. He denied past history of heart disease or cardiac symptom. No tongue biting, jerky motion, cyanosis, but he had trauma. It is the first time for him, so he cannot answer this question whether it occurred in supine or sitting because he has never had this episode before, and he, to his knowledge, he doesn't have any family history of sudden cardiac death. So according to these questions, what do you think or what you are pushed toward? They are pushed toward cardiac syncope or reflex syncope or orthostatic hypotension. So I will leave it for voting. Very easy, but we need to engage the audience with us. Give me the slide with the question. Uh... Okay, because the problem is that the answer is slightly short. Ah, okay. <laughs> don't need, don't need, don't need. That's the answer, my mistake. It's very easy and we're getting the answers. Actually. Okay. Thus, I'm repeating the question. So, is it reflex syncope or sustatic hypotension or cardiac syncope? Yes. So we're getting 100% voting for cardiac syncope. Probably because this channel is called Cardiology Education Channel, so mostly it's going to be a cardiac syncope. Yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> of course, we are more pushed toward cardiac syncope. This patient is a teenager who has an exercise-induced syncope. So I am more pushed toward thinking of cardiac syncope, of course. And most probably it is arrhythmic syncope, like chinopathies, for example. Or he has a structural heart disease. And this leads to exercise-induced syncope. Like, for example, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Sometimes they develop exercise-induced syncope. Someone may ask me is that, for example, in reflex syncope, it was mentioned that sometimes it's related to exertion. Yes, that's right, but there are a key differentiating features. In vasovagal syncope, it may occur after heavy exertion, but usually after completion of exertion, the patient may develop loss of consciousness. Usually, if the syncope occurred during the peak of exercise, for example, that while he is playing or while he is doing sport, at the time, I would think much more of cardiac syncope. This is the key feature in differentiating these two types. Of course, we have four disease groups that may cause the cardiac syncope in this adolescent, like structural heart disease, like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, arrhythmogenic cardiac cardiomyopathy, or dilated. Ischemic, of course, will not common, will not be common in this age. It's channelopathies like long QT syndrome, Fugada, catecholaminergic polymorphic VT, short QT syndrome, or early repolarization. I should not forget that coronary anomaly is one of the famous causes of sudden cardiac death in young age. Abnormal origin of LAD from right coronary cusp with malignant course between aorta and pulmonary artery is one of the important things. And so that's why many electrophysiologists arrange for CT coronaries for patients who have exercise-induced syncope to exclude coronary anomaly. And congenital heart disease, of course, is one of the famous causes as well. So which investigations do we need for this patient? What do you think we need? Of course, we will start with the basic testing and that's why we divided the investigation into basic, bedside and specific. I need to have a resting ECG and an echocardiography for this adolescent. 
his echo was unremarkable. And that's good, of course, as it excludes structural heart disease and it excludes congenital heart disease. But when I did the ECG looking for any one of these high risk feature, either the major features or the minor feature, I found this ECG. What do you, what's your comments on this 12 lead ECG? I will leave it for voting. Are you hearing me now? Maybe if I'm with you. Yeah, I'm what's your giving... comment? I will leave it for the audience. What is your yeah. comment on this ECG for this boy? There is one striking feature. Just notice one striking feature. Shall I answer or leave it for vote? No, leave it, leave it. Okay. Getting 100% votes for a possibly prolonged QT interval because nearly the T wave is midway between the two complexes. So maybe you can explain. Uh, that's right, of course. There is, of course, long QT interval. Even before calculating the correct QT interval, like as a formula, for example, I can find that from the first impression, the actual QT interval in this ECG is much more than a half of the RR interval, and it is also broad-based T waves. So I have long QT interval, and in a patient who have a syncope during exercise, of course, I would think of long QT syndrome, mostly long QT syndrome type 1, which is characterized by exercise-inducing hope. It's more, of course, mentioned in literature, it's more common in swimming, but usually in any exercise, of course, it is very famous. And also, it is characterized by broad-based T waves, which is a striking feature in long QT type 1, which is caused by potassium channelopathies. So, I want to ask myself, if this patient had normal resting ECG, and this is a very common scenario that a patient came to your clinic and told you that you have a syncope, and it is very alerting for you that it may be cardiac syncope, but his ECG is normal. What do you think that I can ask for? Shall I ask for ECG monitoring, for example? Sometimes it's helpful. Of course, we all know the whole term monitoring, which can be left for the patient with 24 hours, 48, 72, sometimes up to four days in some centers. Whole term monitoring, of course, is very useful if the patient has frequent episodes. In this patient, it will not be helpful. Or if, if the patient mentioned you that you have one episode per month, for example, whole term monitoring will not be useful. And that's why I should not ask for whole term monitoring as a routine test for any patient with syncope, I should ask about the frequency of the episodes if it is recurrent. There are other types of ECG monitoring. Maybe some, not all of them are available here, but we should be aware of them if we saw them. There is something called the cardiac memo, which can be left for the patient for about one month. And there is an option is that he can activate the button when he has the episode and this episode is transferred by telemetry to the cardiac investigation unit in the hospital in order that they analyze this episode. So it is much more helpful to analyze the ECG during his episode. It's called cardiac memo or cardio call. There is something called the nubo vest, and it is a very useful test that it is like a vest that can be worn by the patient. And also it is a button that where he activates the button when he have this episode. There is something like an ECG electrode on the inner surface of this vest, and it can record a one channel ECG in order to analyze the ECG during his episode. So these episodes or these tests are useful if the episodes are not frequent. Also, we know that the smartphone have some applications that can uh, use the fingers of the patient in order to record a one strip for the ECG in order to differentiate whether during the episode he had sinus rhythm, SVT, or bradycardia, or for example, VT. Not all phones, of course, have these applications, but it is one of the available tests, and many patients abroad use them to have their ECG recorded during the episode if it is outside the hospital. And this application can have an option that this data can be transferred to a computer and can be printed, and the doctor can see them at the time. And of course, the most 
invasive type of ECG monitoring is a loop recorder. It is not very invasive, it is minimally invasive, but it needs to have like a small incision in order to be implanted just below the skin on the chest wall. It can be left for more than or for many years with the patient in order to record the very infrequent episode if they are not frequent and at that same time, they are not high risk features, I can have the loop recorder. So now the this patient has abnormal resting ECG. So how would I treat this patient? The treatment of long QT syndrome is simplified in the guidelines. First line of treatment, of course, is pizza blockers in some situation. If a patient has a clinical diagnosis of long QT syndrome, it is a plus one indication for pizza blockers. But when to think of ICD, if the patient is a survivor of sudden cardiac arrest, he needs ICD. If the patient has recurrent syncope despite beta blockers, he needs ICD. If the patient has QT interval more than 500, it is a very high risk feature of sudden cardiac death, he needs an ICD. Otherwise, if the patient is symptomatic and he doesn't have arrest or he didn't have hemodynamically unstable BT, I can use beta blockers. Some patients with long QT syndrome type 3, we can use sodium channel blockers, not in our case. No role for EP study, please remember, no role for EP study in long QT syndrome. Left cardiac sympathectomy may be done in some cases. And the guidelines of ventricular arrhythmia in 2015 and also the guidelines of syncope mentioned when to think of ICD and when to think of left cardiac sympathectomy in long QT syndrome. So now I will leave the mic with Dr. Hasib in order to comment on this case. So, Hasib, uh, you may comment on this case, and I also have an important question. Maybe you can help us with answering this. In case you cannot or you do not have an implantable uh, loop recorder, uh, is there any possibility for another investigation to take place? Or once implantable loop recorder is indicated, then it's indicated there is no uh, something else to do instead? Uh, I will pass the mic to Dr. Hasib now to comment on this case. So please go on, Hasib. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zaran. Very nice case uh, explaining the uh, importance of investigations, I must say, in this case. Again, the history is very important. The history is pointing you where you should go, what you should think, and which test you should ask for. So the history in this case is pointing towards the cardiac cause and the test ECG is pointing you what you should think. And with all these, when you integrate all these things, you come to a diagnosis and then you start thinking about the management of the case. Now the question, if, uh, if I'm able to understand uh, accurately, the question was asked if the, if the loop recorder is not available, then what to do? I think that was the question. Yes, well, it is. Yes. Well, I, I must say loop recorders were actually created because there was no other way to diagnose these uh, episodic events. The loop recorder can be uh, placed subcutaneously and they can stay there for almost uh, one year or more. And whenever, the, uh, whenever there will be uh, that event, the loop recorder will record that and you can uh, easily uh, diagnose what is the problem with what is the problem going on there are other devices as well but their life is the life of recording is very less as compared to the loop recording so this so this becomes very difficult what i know the technology is there and they are trying to make everything every device very smart now the people can use their thumb and the fingers and they can put their thumb or fingers at the back of their mobile the mobile has the sensor and that sensor picks single lead ECG or two lead ECG or three lead ECG, and you can send that recording to your uh, uh, physician, your cardiologist or electrophysiologist. And that uh, doctor can take a look at what is going on. Again, now it depends on the patient vigilance. If the patient is feeling that I'm getting palpitation, I'm feeling something, and, he's able, and, and he has sufficient time that he can record to the mobile, then it's okay. But if we cannot do that, then again, we are left with no choice. That's why the loop recorders were record, uh, were created. Just place that small device uh, through the skin subcutaneously and leave it there for one year. Sooner or later, you are going to pick up that abnormality, that VT, non-sustained VT, torts out, whatever there is going on. And then you can go for the decision of that patient. 
regarding i would uh, highlight uh, would like to again emphasize on the uh, treatment strategy in such patients do not forget beta blockers they are the first line of choice in long qt syndrome if the patient cannot tolerate uh, beta blockers then go for the icds if the patient is having icd is having beta blocker or cannot tolerate beta blocker having vt storm on icds please go to the left cardiac sympathetic, uh, sympathetic denervation and the genes are different in every long qt so you have to be you have to be very cautious about the use of which antibiotic you are uh, sorry which beta blocker you are giving to your patient this is very important because not every beta blocker works for every long qt and and we know there are multiple uh, long qt syndrome so we have to uh, take care of this consideration as well so i have a question hasi related to this that not every long qt comes from the same uh, genetic we have uh, genetic mutations of the sodium channel and i think one of them is responsible for one forms of the long qt and i have a question about using the drug uh, ranulazine which affects the long qt through the affecting the sodium channel because it's a sodium channel blocker and they say that this drug is very commonly used in cardiac patients uh, also we have a very uh, important uh, raised uh, question about hydroxychloroquine and uh, the induced uh, long qt syndrome acquired form and uh, the row about uh, long qt syndrome that's induced by hydroxychloroquine and does it usually affect mortality because people have been using hydroxychloroquine for rheumatoid and lupus and multiple sclerosis and antiphospholipid antibody syndrome for many 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 years as well as of course using them uh, this form is immunomodulation and also using them for malaria as an antimicrobial so actually uh, first question is ranolazine uh, and sodium channel blockade and long qt syndrome this is one question the second question is do we really need to worry about using hydroxychloroquine for acquired long qt syndrome and does the acquired long qt syndrome induced by hydroxychloroquine translate to an inducible ventricular tachycardia and sudden cardiac death? I know it's a tough question and I want a very short answer, Hasid. Yes, I will make it very simple for you. So the rule of thumb is you have to avoid every drug which has this ability to prolong the QT interval. Now, if you have an individual who has a normal QT and his genotype is normal and you have another patient who has abnormal genotype leading to abnormal QT interval. And both of them are taking hydroxychloroquine or whatever the drug you're talking about, which has the uh, ability to prolong the QT. Who is going to be affected more? The person with the abnormal gene or the person with the normal gene? Of course, the person with the abnormal gene is at highest risk of developing prolonged QT. And whenever you are going to have prolonged QT, whether it is due to genetic cause, whether it is due to uh, drug abuse or any other thing you are at high risk of developing VT, torsad and sudden cardiac arrest so that's why the one of the most important thing when you are telling about all the medications to your patient with long QT syndrome the first thing you would like to tell him you would like to counsel please stay away from the emotional stress number one and number two please avoid all those drugs which have the ability to prolong your QT interval. And that's why we have dedicated websites available on the internet. And they have a whole list of drugs from every category, antibiotic, anti allergics et cetera, et cetera, who has the ability, who, uh, who have the ability to prolong QT. So you have to avoid everything. Do not take risk in such patients as long QT syndrome who are already on risk of having certain cardiac death. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Hasib, uh, for this brief and uh, comprehensive answer. And now we're moving to case uh, number three with uh, Dr. Sharif. So, Sharif, you have the mic. Okay. Uh, the third case is one of the scenarios that sometimes we see in our practice. And when this scenario is seen by many cardiologists, 
it raised like some controversy or some confusion about what should be the protocol. And that's why I selected this case scenario. A 52 year old male presented to the OBC complaining of two fainting attacks one week ago. The first one occurred while he was sitting in front of the TV without any warning and persisting for one minute as told by his wife. The second one occurred while he was eating and lasted for about 10 to 20 seconds and he denied any choking before it. He is a smoker and he has a history of anterior stemi two years ago for which he had primary PCI to proximal LED total occlusion after pentadol of eight hours. He is taking now aspirin 100 milligram once per day, resolvastatin, presoprolol, and dramipril. And on examination, his blood pressure was 100 over 60, heart rate was 70, chest and cardiac examination were unremarkable with no lower limb injury. Now we have this scenario that may be pushing us towards one of the causes, but we need to apply the same rules that we applied in the first two cases. We need to answer the four questions that we repeated in each case. So, was it loss of consciousness? It seems yes. Was it syncopal or non-syncopal? It seems much more towards syncopal, but we need also to stress certain clinical tips in the case. First thing, the patient mentioned that the first episode occurred while he was sitting in front of TV. He was not standing. So, this is much more pushing us toward cardiac syncope away from, for example, orthostatic or reflex syncope. And the second one, oh, and sorry, and also it persisted for a short duration. So it is a transient loss of consciousness. The second one, while he was eating, and most probably he was sitting while he was eating, and there was no choking. So they occurred during sitting position. The patient, which is a very important hint in this case, the patient is non ischemic He has anterior STEMI, and he had primary PCI after eight hours. So I suppose that this patient may have LV dysfunction. And so... I am much more thinking of uh, having cardiac syncope in this patient. So do we need to ask about other questions? Of course, yes. Palpitation, associated tongue fighting, jerking, blah, blah, blah. Did it occur in a standing position or not? Family history of sudden cardiac deaths. He denied palpitation. He denied but, uh, tongue fighting or cryocyanosis, but he had jerking motion, as mentioned by his wife. No, it didn't occur in standing, and he has no family history of sudden cardiac deaths, but family history of coronary artery disease. So what do you think the cause of syncope? I think here, Dr. Zahran, that it is much more clear here that we are going towards cardiac syncope, of course. That's right. So of course. Without, we, don't, we don't need to vote. We don't need to vote, of course. So here, I am thinking of a cardiac syncope. Most probably, it is a rhythmic syncope. Mostly, I would think of BT. Why are th we are thinking of BT? Because this patient has structural heart disease based on the history of anterior STEMI, and mostly he has ischemic LV dysfunction based on the relatively long pain to door duration and based on the low normal blood pressure. And I want to stress a certain important point. Jerking motion that sometimes occur during loss of consciousness, please, it is not a rule that this is epilepsy. No, jerking motion can occur with cardiac syncope or with any type of syncope because the cerebral hypoxia caused by hyperperfusion can lead to jerking motion. So please don't, when you hear, hear this word that he has some like shivering or something like a jerking motion, don't go ahead that refers this patient to a neurologist with an epilepsy. No, it may be also syncope. So this is not the key in this case. The key is about how to select the investigation, how to manage. First, we are going to start with a basic investigation, resting ECG and echo. Resting ECG, I'm sorry for the quality of the ECG, it shows like pathological cue with some residual ST elevation. And when compared with the previous ECG of the patient, it nearly showed the same. So it suggests that this patient has anterior STEMI, which most probably was not successfully reperfused at the suitable time. When we had echocardiography, it showed that he had LV dysfunction with estimated ejection fraction 40 to 45 with akinetic apex apical anterior wall, mid anterior septum, and apical posterior septum. And the ejection fraction by Simpson and also by eyeballing was 40 to 45 percent. So now we need to ask ourselves, after you saw the echo showing LV dysfunction, and after you heard the two syncopal episodes, which investigation would you select for this patient? Would you select ECG monitoring with any type of them, EP study, or ICD? 
I will leave it for voting now. Yes, this is very important to vote because it's a little bit tricky question. This is a very nice question because it will, uh, it will give us a very good brainstorming. But before I hear your answer, Sharif, can you please go back to the slide with the history of the patient? Because this is very important here. Yes, this is the history. Yes, here. Okay. So this guy is an ischemic patient and he's a post anterior infarction. Let me see the echo, please. Okay. His echo shows an ejection fraction of 40 to 45 percent. Okay. So I'm getting an 80 percent for ICD and I'm getting a 20 percent for an electrophysiological study. I would like you to elaborate for the answer, please. Okay, so now I will discuss the question now, okay, Dr. Zahram? Yes. Okay, so to be honest with you, it is a difficult question. And in many times, this question is raising a lot of confusion and controversy when we are discussing it on WhatsApp groups of electrophysiologists in our university hospital. You'll find some different opinions. And so I will try to analyze in an objective way how would we select the appropriate test for this patient? First of all, according to the guidelines of EC in 2018 of Synco, they mentioned an important tip that, of course, we know that if the ejection fraction is less than 35%, this patient may directly receive an indication for primary prevention if he applies a criteria about much more than six weeks after the MI, receiving optimized medical treatment, and he is symptomatic and much more if this patient who have ejection fraction less than 35 have a syncope, I can call directly like here in the second row that ICD is indicated in patient with syncope due to VT and the ejection fraction less than 35. But this patient has just moderate LP dysfunction from 40 to 45. So I can look here at this one that ICD should be considered in patient with ejection fraction more than 35 with recurrent syncope due to VT when catheter ablation and pharmacological therapy have failed or could not be performed. So someone may select this table and say, I would go directly for ITD. But the problem is that I don't have documented tachycardia. I cannot assume that it is VT. Yes, it is most probably VT, but I'm not 100% sure of this. And also I have not tried other option and ejection fraction, as we said, is more than 35. So maybe that if you apply this rule, you are not going strictly with the guidelines because they told you if the patient has recurrent syncope due to VT, which is not the real situation because of lack of documentation. So let's move to another tip of the guidelines, also from the EC guidelines. They mentioned here that ICD should be considered in patient with unexplained syncope, which is here the situation with systolic impairment, but without a current indication for ICD to reduce risk of sudden cardiac death. What does that mean? Here, if the patient has less than 35%, yes, you can go directly for primary prevention using ICD. If it is more than 45 and having unexplained syncope, 
you have the right to go for ICD. And that's why having ICD is not a wrong answer here, but it is one of the views that the guidelines explain here that it is class 2A to think of it just because of unexplained syncope and systolic impairments. But let's move to another more precise part in the guidelines. When the guidelines are discussing the indications of EP study, they mention a very important indication. The first one here, read it with us, patient with syncope and previous myocardial infarction or other scar-related conditions like dilated cardiomyopathy or arrhythmogenic RV cardiomyopathy. EP study is indicated when syncope remains unexplained after non-invasive evaluation. Is this one applying to our situation here? I think yes. The patient has syncope. The patient has previous myocardial infarction, which was not successfully perfused. He has a scar-related condition because if he had an undevascularized MI, he has a scar in his heart. And so we can go class one indication for EP study because his syncope is unexplained after non-invasive evaluation. We couldn't have an ECG monitoring to record him. So I think here we can say that we need to go for an EP study. Also, in order to important to mention that in patient with unexplained syncope and previous MI or other scar related, when we have EP study and the induction of sustained VT, I should manage it according to the guidelines of ventricular arrhythmia. And here it is directly stated and clearly stated that if you had an EP study and you have an inducible VT during EP study, you can go directly for an ITD without any controversy. So EP study has clear indications here. We know indications, for example, in bicuspid block or in patient with sinus bradycardia. But here we are stressing on the first indication and the only class one indication. Patient with syncope, previous MI or scar-related heart disease have unexplained syncope. I can go for EP study. So if I repeat this question again, what would you select? For my opinion, I would select EP study to have something called a VT stem protocol. I am looking for inducible VT during the study, although I cannot consider that choosing ICD is wrong. No, it is a point of view, but for me, I prefer EP study before going for an ICD, which will have a deleterious effect on the lifestyle of the patient. So I need to be like sure of the indication using an EP study. So if there is inducible VT in the AP study, I will go for ICD, of course. If there is no inducible VT, I can try to optimize the anti ischemic treatment, especially the medications that lower oh, mortality and following up the blood pressure to guarantee that there is no hypertension. So this is our case here. And I want, of course, to hear the point of view from Dr. Hasid. Yes, before you finish the case, because this is very important and jumping uh, to my mind and to many audiences' mind also, do we have a role to perform a coronary angiography and revascularization according to the viability uh, study, or this will not affect our decision regarding the AP study and the uh, application or ICD evaluation? So shall I answer or leave it to Dr. Hasib? I want you to answer this question because Hasib will say the final flow chart after this. Okay, so in, uh, here we have two opinions in this case. Some opinions mention that I would go only for coronary angiography if there are features suggesting ongoing ischemia or there is evidence of viability. At that time, I can go for coronary angiography and revascularization because if there is ongoing ischemia, of course, this patient needs coronary angiography before all of these investigations. And if there is viability, Revascularization will improve the LV function, will change the conduction properties of the tissue around the scar, which may lead to reducing the recurrence of ventricular arrhythmia. And if there is no viability and no evidence of ischemia, there is no rule for coronary revascularization because it is a scar tissue and it will not benefit. There is another opinion, to be honest with you, and I found it with many electrophysiologists uh, in our university, that they don't go for EP study or ICD or even ablation before thinking of revascularization, regardless of viability. 
as he mentioned that viability now is class 2b in the guidelines so i will not depend only on positive viability to go for coronary angio i can go for revascularization if there is an option and if the patients still have vt after revascularization or there is no rule at all for revascularization according to his coronary anatomy at that time they go for ep study or icg for example so there are two opinions in this situation Yes, I think the opinion here is a little bit difficult because actually you cannot demarcate a very clear demarcation mark between the arrhythmia induced by the scar and the arrhythmia induced by ongoing ischemia because the coronary anatomy is not only one single vessel, it's the infarct-related artery. Actually, usually the patient has atherosclerosis in most of his coronary tree and you can have multiple stenotic lesions in other territories and those lesions induce ischemia and ischemia also can induce uh, arrhythmias. So usually you're trying to attack the arrhythmic episodes or the arrhythmic cascade arising from the scar on one hand and arising from the ongoing ischemia on the other hand because at the end of the day what matters most is to ameliorate and reduce the, uh, the ischemia and the tachycardia or the arrhythmia burden for such a patient so you will use all the possible tools including the medical therapy the intervention and the device and the ablation so uh, Hasib, i will leave you the mic because i know you have an interesting flow chart to say about this case and then you can start uh, wrapping up uh, the whole session. So uh, next slide, Sharif, and uh, the, you will move the slides, Sharif, as long as Hasib is uh, talking. And you may go on, uh, Hasib, please. Okay. Thank you, uh, Zaran. Very interesting uh, case, uh, the case number three related to the structural heart disease of ischemia. A very common case. And uh, I agree with you the, uh, regarding the caveats. Uh, the ongoing ischemia is creating the uh, the syncope, the non-sustained VT or VT, and the sudden cardiac death. And on the other side, the scar-related VT is also there. So we have to tackle the both conditions. Uh, so right now, uh, you can see a flow chart. This flow chart, I have taken this flow chart from the American Heart, Heart Association guidelines. And uh, if you start from the top, the primary prevention in patients with ischemic heart disease with left ventricular ejection fraction of equal to or less than 40%. And the question is, is the MI less than 40 days or the revascularization is less than 90 days? If yes, you move to the right side of the screen. Of the, screen. the right side of the screen says at the top, EP study, especially in the presence of non-sustainability. So if you have a documented non-sustainability, that is fine. And if you are suspecting that there might be runs of non-sustainability, it is also fine. EP study is your first choice. Take the patient to the cath lab, try to reduce VT. If you have that VT, the, so far, the trials which have been done, uh, if I remember it correctly, it was MUST trial, a subgroup of MUST trial in which they did the EP study, and then they divided the patients, those patients who had inducible VT, they implanted ICD. These patients had a reduction in mortality. That's why uh, you can see the ICD is class one according to the Americans. The other option at the bottom is you continue with the guideline directed medical therapy because you are uh, you are giving the beta blockers which have anti arrhythmic properties and the other anti arrhythmic drugs you can also give like amitron or sotalol. And still, if you are not going for EP study. You have the option of WCD, that is variable cardio defibrillator, until 40 days post MI or until 90 days post revascularization. And then you can again reassess and then you can decide for the implantable. This is a variable cardio defibrillator. Now you can decide about the implantable cardio defibrillator, whether the patient needs it or not. So this is the right part of the screen. Now, if you come towards the bottom, we know all these things. So I will go through them very quickly. The main point which Sharif uh, highlighted was the use of EP study. We can divide the patients into groups with the help of EP study, and we can decide whether this patient needs ICD or not. ICD will give benefit, mortality benefit or not in those patients. So the downward groups, we know all of them. Um, the 
important thing in the first three in the first two groups is the ejection fraction if the ejection fraction is less than 30 percent even the function class is one icd is class one indication definite benefit the other group ejection fraction is less than 35 percent function class is two or three the patient is symptomatic go for icd definite benefit for the patient now the third group of the patient is Ejection fraction is less than 40%. There is non-sustainability documented and you have sustained VT on EP study. Same situation there. Only the difference is regarding post 40 day, uh, post MI 40 days and post reverse crushing 40 days. If yes, if you are getting an inducible VT on the EP, go for the ICD class one. Otherwise continue with the guideline directed medical therapy Try to optimize the beta blockers, and if you are using any anti-arrhythmic drugs, try to optimize them also. And the fourth group is in the patients uh, who have who are in function class one. That is, these are the patients who need advanced heart failure therapy. And for those patients, they say yes, you can go for IC implantation. They have not highlighted it as class one indication. They have highlighted it as class two A indication. If no. ICD should not be implanted. Class three, no benefit. So this is just a nutshell from the uh, American uh, guideline. It might be useful for you, especially for our uh, cardiology residents who are the future of cardiology. I think uh, this can come in very handy if you have this in your mobile or. Uh, yes, very nice, you uh, Hasib, and thank you for sharing this one with us. I think now it's time for you to wrap up the session uh, in a few minutes. Uh, so Sharif, uh, Sharif needs to say the take home messages first and then you will wrap up. Okay, uh, Sharif, so, uh, so we have three take home message here and the end of these three cases and the end of resume of the guidelines. First of all, all will think of the four basic questions when you encounter a patient with a blackout episodes. For example, what are the question? Was the event transient loss of consciousness? Number two, was it syncopal or non syncopal? Number three, is there a clear etiology for the syncope? Number four, are there any high risk features or not? Second thing, meticulous history taking is a cornerstone in reaching the exact cause of syncope and excluding other differential diagnoses. Okay, much more time for history taking before rushing to the investigations because they are the clue to reaching the diagnosis. Either you may decide just have some basic testing like EDG and ECHO and no need for other investigation because it is very clear, or sometimes you may need to have much more investigation according to your professional diagnosis. And the last thing, please tailor your investigation and treatment according to the suggested etiology. There is no panel of tests for each patient with syncope. There is nothing called that each patient will present with syncope. I would order ECG, ECHO, the table test, and Volter, and this is a routine test that I do for any patient. No, that's not right. Because, for example, you can arrange for a tilt table test for a patient with arrhythmic syncope, and the history is very suggestive of tachyarrhythmia, like the second case. And the tilt table test was false positive. So you treat this patient as vasovagal syncope, and he will have sudden cardiac arrest, as Dr. Hasib mentioned before, because you didn't pay attention to the history taken. So these are the three take-home messages from our Thank case. you. Thank you so much, uh, Sharif, uh, for the big effort here. Uh, Hasib, uh, can you wrap up, please? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Zahran, and very wonderful take-home message by Dr. Sharif. I must appreciate. Uh, so can I uh, use the uh, slides, or the, or are you going to uh, use uh, to go to and fro for these slides as I run. You can proceed the Hasib uh, Sharif is controlling with you, no problem. Okay. Or you can request control from upstairs options. Yes, options, uh, yes, and yes, request uh, control and Sharif will approve your request. Let me let me try. Okay, so Check. Yes, I approve the yeah, Dr. Hasib. You can control, you take the control now. Okay, okay. I think I can. Yeah. Okay. So, thank you so much. Uh, once again, I have been asked to quickly wrap up 
uh, today's webinar. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to highlight the most important points, especially not taking into consideration that we are electrophysiologists or a consultant cardiologist. I'm especially focused on the cardiology residents, which I know they are uh, listening to this webinar from different parts of the world. What I want to, uh, uh, I want you to know, there are three points that you should remember when you are thinking of syncope. Number first, the syncope is an abrupt thing. Okay. Number two, it is transient, but with complete loss of consciousness. And number three is, it is followed by the rapid and spontaneous recovery. So whenever you have these three things, you will label it as syncope. Otherwise, you cannot label it as syncope. Got it? So my question is, do you think every loss of consciousness is a syncope? Let me put an example. For example, if a patient is uh, developing unconsciousness due to hypoglycemia, so will you say that this patient is developing syncope due to hypoglycemia? Although the patient is getting a complete loss of, uh, is uh, uh, getting away from the conscious level, but you will never label it as syncope. The reason behind it, the reason behind it is the mechanism. What is the mechanism of syn uh, mechanism behind when you label it as syncope? The mechanism is decreased cerebral perfusion. Everything which will lead to decreased cerebral perfusion will result in syncope, otherwise not. The second thing that I want you to remember is the vasovagal syncope. Why vasovagal syncope? Because it is the most common type of syncope that you are going to face in your life, in your clinics, in your boards. And for vasovagal syncope, I want you to focus on four things. Number one, there is, whenever you are taking a history of vasovagal syncope, you will always find a trigger. That, that trigger can be prolonged standing, prolonged seated position, or with some exposure to emotional stress, pain, or the medical settings, okay? So this, the first thing is the trigger. Now the second thing, the patient will tell you about some symptoms that he develops before becoming unconscious. This is called prodrome. And the examples of prodrome are diaphoresis, excessive sweating, feeling warm, nausea and pallor. And after the prodrome, the third thing, uh, which is common in vasovagal syncope is the vasodepressor response. The vasodepressor hypertension with or without inappropriate bradycardia. You can have bradycardia, you may not have the bradycardia. And the fourth thing, after having all these three things, the patient will feel fatigue after recovery. So if you are getting all these four points in the history of a patient, please think of vasovagal syncope first. It is a clinical diagnosis. You will never need to go for tilt table test or any other investigation. You can just quickly make your diagnosis based on the history of the patient. Third thing, cardiac syncope. Which one is cardiac syncope? Which one is not cardiac syncope? Let's make it clear. Any syncope due to bradycardia or tachycardia or hypertension. And the reason for hypertension should be due to low cardiac index, due to blood flow obstruction, vasodilation, or acute vascular dissection. If you are getting all these things or either these things leading to syncope, think of cardiac syncope. Now, what, now we are left with the non-cardiac syncope. What is non-cardiac? Reflex syncope orthostatic hypertension, volume depletion, dehydration, and blood loss, any sort of blood loss. If you are having these related to your patients, please put them under the umbrella of non-cardiac syncope. Try to learn this, cardiac syncope and non-cardiac syncope. And this is very important, uh, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which is POTS, very important, you should never miss it, especially for the residents. And what it is, symptoms, the patient will develop symptoms that occur only with standing. And these symptoms include lightheadedness, palpitations, tremors, generalized weakness, blurred vision, and exercise intolerance or fatigue, only on standing. And the other thing which is common is 
on standing there will be increase in the heart rate of at least 30 or more than 30 beat per minute during a positional change that is when you are standing and if the age of the patient is 12 to 19 year of age it is 40 or more than 40 beat per minute you will get an increase in the heart rate and the third thing is there will be the absence of orthostatic hypotension which is more than 20 mm mercury of reduction in the systolic pain so if you are having these three things in the same patient please think of pots it has very good results if you treat uh, treat that patient don't miss it must know the high risk features don't miss it must know your differentials i'm not going to name all the differentials must know when to go for investigations and must know which test is for which condition do not waste the money do not waste patient's time and do not waste your own time and let me repeat once again if you want to hit straight at the center this is my tip for you dr sharif emphasizes i am emphasizing it once again take complete history of the patient number 1 please do the proper physical examination of the patient if you do these two things properly you are not going to miss a patient coming with syncope i promise this with you and let me give you another thing let's let us let's make it a try it if you want to add something add a test called ecg that's it this triad is enough for you mark my words get expertise in complete history taking get expertise in doing the physical examination get expertise in interpretation of the ecg if you can do these three things you are never going to miss any patient of syncope thank you so much for your listening and i am very 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 thankful to dr zaharan very thankful to dr sharif for such a nice webinar um, it was very interesting and i learned a lot from uh, today's discussion thank you so much thank you so much uh, dear hasib we actually learned a lot from you uh, and it was a great honor and addition scientific uh, profile to this uh, great team actually i'm glad to have you on board uh, sharif i have a question for you from the audience uh, for case number 3 you said uh, you can uh, insert an icd after your ep study and they are asking about the possibility of uh, performing ablation uh, for the scar induced ventricular tachycardia uh, on the question one is uh, is this um, uh, is this uh, intervention on board for treatment of scar related vt number two uh, how successful it is and number three do we do this uh, ablation in addition to the icd or as a substitution to the icd so maybe you can answer sharif now okay so at first let's differentiate between two simple types of vt we have monomorphic vt which is the idiopathic vt that occurs in a structurally normal heart and this type of vt arises from a single focus in the heart like for example the most common sites are the ut tachycardia or sometimes called fascicular vt which may occur in young males this type is suitable for ablation because you are just looking for one focus to ablate and this lead to complete termination of the vt the second type is a scar related vt which is what is, are we talking here in this case scar related vt occurs in patient with a scar related heart disease like ischemic heart dysfunction or dilated cardiomyopathy or arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy these type of scar related vt is very difficult to ablate because you are not ablating one focus you are trying to do something called scar isolation i'm trying to use something called 3d and electroanatomical mapping and this type of mapping like what's called the car2 or the navix and this mapping try to draw the scar in front of me and i am ablating around it it is very difficult sometimes you may need to have epicardial ablation in dilated cardiomyopathy for example and this is very difficult and results are not very good sometimes success rate may not be very high and we may tell the patient that there is a possibility of recurrence after ablation they may reach 20% for example or according to the centers and also there is a risk of complication especially if we are doing epicardial that's why the answer to the first question that we go to the icd 
in patients with structural heart disease like those before ablation. And if the patient is still having recurrent appropriate shocks for VT episodes or VT storm, for example, at that time, I may decide to go for ablation, but not the first choice because the success rate is not very high in this case. So that's why ICD is the first choice before ablation. Uh, that's, I'm, I'm, I don't remember the third question. What was the third question? For I answered the first question by this, but there was another question, I think. Uh, it was about the success. Is it a successful uh, procedure? And you said usually it's not uh, that successful, but sometimes you need uh, to resort uh, to this final option. Yeah. Course, so yeah. uh, I would like to catch this opportunity actually, and I would like to thank uh, Dr. Hasib Raza, he's a cardiac electrophysiologist uh, at the National Institute of Cardiovascular Diseases in Karachi, Pakistan, and he's a very active board member of the International Young Academy of Cardiology, and he's an author of many chapters about electrophysiology in uh, specific electrophysiology books and is very famous in Pakistan. I'm very glad and honored to have you on board today. Uh, Hasib, thank you so much. I thank you so much, like Zaharan, for Dr. having me here. It is an honor for me, actually, for uh, sitting in front of you. Uh, it is thank actually, the, the pleasure is all mine, actually. It's my pleasure as well, also, Dr. Hasib and Dr. Zahran, to be one of the members of this uh, interesting lecture. It, I, I, I have benefited a lot. I have got a lot of benefit. A lot yes. of Me too, actually, myself. I have learned a lot. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sharif, uh, for uh, presenting this very elegant uh, presentation, including uh, the steps for diagnosis uh, and the guidelines, followed by three informative cases, uh, which made the information actually very easy for us uh, to tackle a very, very difficult uh, topic, actually, that usually we do not like uh, to study because it's usually not that good for us or not that easy to study, but you made it so easy today uh, with your collaboration with Hasib. I would like to thank all the attendees, uh, Professor Haytham, uh, Khalid Shams, uh, Ahmed Tomati, uh, Emmanuel, and everyone who joined us today. And of course, finally, uh, I would like to thank uh, I would like to thank Peggy Gerges also, who is the president of EAC, and who joined us today. And of course, finally, I would like to thank uh, the elegant uh, CDC board, uh, Dr. Karim Mahmoud, uh, Dr. Hassan Suleiman, Dr. Abrahman Gamal, and Dr. Ahmed Saeed. Next Thursday, do not miss a very interesting webinar, which is also somewhat related to today's webinar. It's going to be discussing the sudden cardiac death, and we have a very elegant and distinguished speaker, Professor Ahmed Ramati, on board. So Ahmed will give us a very good uh, lecture about uh, sudden cardiac death, and we will have some good cases also uh, at the same time, uh, 9 p.m. So I cannot wait to see you again uh, next Saturday, uh, less than 48 hours. We will be going on with the congenital course. And we have a very interesting topic about ventricular septal defects to be presented by my dear friend, uh, Dr. Amira. She is a lecturer of cardiology at Ain Shams University, and she's a PhD and MRCP holder. So it's going to be a very nice and elegant lecture also. Uh, I'm glad to have you all on board. Greatly honored uh, for this session, and hopefully we'll see you uh, next week uh, in very good health and very good shape. And stay safe and take care. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Zahran. Thank you, Dr. Hasib, for this pleasure, of course. Thank you so much, Dr. Zahran and Dr. Sharif. It was nice meeting you and it was a wonderful time spent of my life. Thank you so much.